Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible, you guessed it, chapter, chapter by right? chapter, <laughs> and give you your whole Bible back. Now, where did we get that statement? <laughs> One of my mentors used to make a statement. He said, if you want to know what God is saying in your life, go read all the verses in your Bible that are not underlined. And that implies expositional study of the Bible contrasted with topical study. Topical study is the most common approach to uh, sermon preparation where a minister goes and he hops through the scriptures and pulls together verses about his specific and chosen subject that he's going to talk about in a particular message. But Paul told Titus and Timothy, give attention to reading which is expositional. It's allowing the narrative of the scripture to present its message to you in the manner in which God intended. And then you gain access to a level of truth that you're not going to find any other way. And we're currently in the book of uh, Proverbs, which is, and we've been, it just seems like for a long time, we've been in Job and Psalms. In Job, it's like we got all contaminated by the, chapter after chapter of the thinking of Job's friends, and then we got to Psalms and just had a nice 150 chapter decontamination. It's like a nice shower. <laughs> and uh, now we come to the book of Proverbs, and today is Giving Day. And this morning, as I was preparing to sit down for the study, uh, I heard the Lord say this, how would Jesus take an offering? How would Jesus take an offering. In fact, how would Jesus ask for something that his audience could little afford to give? Uh, because when you say, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Well, sure he would. <laughs> because he had every intention of uh, meeting the needs of those that he petitioned. And if we look in John 21, 5, now, remember, John 21, 5, if you're familiar with the passage, this is where they had the net-breaking catch. What would a net-breaking catch look like in your life? And what would you be prepared to do in anticipation of a net-breaking catch? Well, Jesus, they'd surely, they'd be, probably been asking God. They'd been fishing all night long. How many of you have been at it? All night long. You've been at it all week long, all life long. And you've been wanting to see something happen in your life. You've been looking for breakthrough, financial breakthrough, uh, benefit, blessing, provision, increase, prosperity, life and life more abundantly. Just not, not asking for something that is untoward, just what Jesus promised. And uh, so they get to a certain position and it said that Jesus stood on the shore and the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. So here's somebody standing in front of them, and they don't know if it's Jesus or not. And he says, children, have you any meat? Now, what was he doing? He's, a, he's taking up an offering. And can you imagine if the pastor got up and said, uh, folks, do y'all have any money? And it says they answered to him, no. Uh -huh. And isn't that, you know, everybody gives an answer. Every time an ordained minister of God gets up under the anointing of God and receives an offering, every person gives a yes or no answer. If they, uh, if they don't give, they're saying no. If they do give, they're saying yes. Mm -hmm. And so look what happened. Children, have you any meat? Can you imagine a, a minister, your pastor, gets up on Sunday morning and we're going we're gonna to receive the offering and you're looking at him and it's like they said they didn't know it was Jesus. And so they're looking at him and they don't know if what he's about to do is God or not. You turn around, you look at that person next to you, you think that's God? Uh, no, I, I don't know that that's God. They didn't know it was Jesus. <laughs> and he says, children, and he provoked the issue. You know, usually when you take an offering, you don't want people thinking about what they don't have. Jesus went right to the jugular. He said, children, do you have any meat? In other words, like taking an offering. Children, do you have any money? And they said, no. <laughs> My. <laughs> and, but notice what he said. Well, we'll give anyway. And notice that he wasn't saying, we're taking this up for, you know, <laughs> there's a disingenuous 
thing that happens sometimes, and I'm not trying to impugn motives, but so many times we see someone when they receive an offering, oh, we want you to give to the orphans in Haiti. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But uh, Jesus wasn't doing that. He was asking for something for himself, like the prophet that said, make me a little cake first. He wasn't asking uh, for trying to provoke it. Let me justify, you know, do you have any money? No, well, let me justify what I'm about to ask you for. Jesus didn't do that. He said, he, he said, children, have you any meat? He was asking for something for himself. So children, have you any meat? No, we, we don't have it. He said, well, give anyway. Give anyway. And what happened at the end, it said they received a net-breaking catch. So much so that their ability to contain what God gave them in response, they had to reach out and get somebody else's help. Can you imagine having such a financial response? to a sacrificial gift that you have to go to your next door neighbor say, excuse me, I'm your next door neighbor and God has really blessed me. I, I gave an offering out of my penury and God has blessed me so much that I don't have enough bank account to hold all this money. Would you mind, would you let me borrow your bank account for a week <laughs> till I can go down and see my banker and get things lined out? Mm. That's exactly what they did. That's right. They had to call for the people in the... Imagine God blessing your business so much that you have to go across uh, town to the competitor who's been trying to put you out of business and say, excuse me, I gave a sacrificial gift the other day and God blessed me so much, I really need help to meet the needs of all. Would you mind helping me? <laughs> Would you mind coming over here and helping me? I'll be glad to pay you. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's life and life more abundantly. It's what is given in response. It's he, to giving not according to what you have, but according to what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And so everybody gives an answer. What's the difference between going home empty-handed and mending your nets for the rest of the week and receiving the net breaking catch. It's one of two answers. It's either, children, have you any meat? No, what are you going to do next? Or, children, have you any meat? No, I don't have any meat. And I don't know if that's God or not, but I'm going to give anyway. Uh -huh. And so if you need a net breaking catch in your life, I want you right now to go to propheticnow.com, go to fathersheartministry.net, click on the donate link, and I'm not saying give what you have, give what you don't have. Oh, how dare you do that? Isn't that what the prophet did to the starving widow? Yes, he did. And Jesus said, there were many widows who starved to death in Israel or in the ranks of religion. Mm -hmm. But the prophet wasn't sent to one of them. He was sent to a woman of Zarephath. Why? Because he knew that though she was a starving widow and could not foresee anything happening but something negative if she gave him, gave the prophet a little cake first. But yet she, he knew she would comply. And because she complied, said, the prophet and her, the widow and her child did eat many days. Many days. Are you ready for a many days breakthrough? Amen. Are you ready for a many days resource? Something that will get you through? Oh, listen, folks. It's time to put our foot in the neck of the enemy. Amen. By doing what you see the Father do. Have you any meat? Go to propheticnow.com. Click on the donate link. Go now. Go while you're listening. Go while the anointing is there. And when the anointing is there and you give in the anointing, something supernatural happens. So Father, we thank you, thank you Father. for the net breaking catch. We thank you for what you have taught us about sowing and reaping and giving yes, and being sacrificial and what happens as a result. We thank you that we're moving into the we're going to eat many days season. Yes, because Lord, we're willing to be provoked and we're willing to be challenged out of the status quo. God, we know if we want what we've never had before, we have to do what we've never done before. And I pray that you would shake us and that you would rattle us to break us out of the poverty mentality and to take authority not just over what we have but what we don't have. And move whether we think it's God or not because we know that the mind of man cannot conceive, cannot posture or move us into that place of breakthrough. Let it come now. Speak now to every person that's listening. What is the amount? What is the net breaking catch amount? What is it that they can ill afford to give?
that once they give it, they move into the many days season of blessing. What is that, Father? Speak it now to the people. And I want you to go now to propheticnow.com and click on the donation link. You can give through PayPal. You can give through Square, which doesn't record a membership. You can give if you're if you're in another country. You can give through Western Union, and there's information there. You can call on the phone. Call our number. You may have to leave a message, and we'll get back to you and call you back and let you allow you and help you give your gift that way. Our PO box is there. Our mailing. Uh, address is there as well but I, I just challenge you to act now and as you act I know God I know God is going to move in the area of your finances Amen. praise, praise God. God don't you love Fridays who's with me we're with you Papa <laughs> Warren Hunter says so today we're studying Proverbs chapter 2 Proverbs chapter 2, accessing the path of the righteous. Accessing the path of the righteous. Proverbs 2 speaks of the attributes of the wisdom of God and the benefits of acquiring the wisdom of God in our lives. Wisdom in God is something more than being witty or crafty or erudite or intellectual. The wisdom of God, you could have the IQ of a turnip and the wisdom of God will put you over in life. Wisdom is not rooted in an ability to get ahead of others. Wisdom is not rooted from God. Wisdom is not rooted to the ability to step on others to achieve success. The wisdom of God is a spiritual something. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of God is one of the seven spirits of God. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.30, the wisdom of God is something that God made Jesus to be to us when he went to the cross in our behalf. Amen. The wisdom of God is a force that once it enters into our hearts will change the entire trajectory of our lives. That's right. <laughs> Thank God for wisdom. So let's begin by reading Proverbs 2 verses 1 through 9. Please, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear into wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifts up your, thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searches for her as for a hid treasure, <clears throat> then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgments and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shall thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. So I like that. If you cry after not, what are you crying after? What mm -hmm. provokes you to get loud? <laughs> what do you what do you cry? I love what a guy over in uh, West Plains, Missouri, years ago when I was an overseer in a, the Bible Way denomination. I was the number two guy in this Pentecostal denomination, and uh, this they they had a lot of pastors and preachers, just backwoods fellows preaching in their overalls, <laughs> and uh, this guy. He get, preached a message in the camp meeting. Sawdust, floor, rough plank, pews, open walls, open air, tabernacle, crickets, uh, singing out there, competing with the, the sound system. And about 200 people gathered. And this guy is out there and he's got his thumbs hooked in his overalls. And he's talking about spiritual hunger. He says, you know, when it comes to the th things of God, I'm just hoggish about the things of God. I just when I f read the Word of God and I study the Word of God, I, I just get hoggish about the things of God. <laughs> I never forgot it. It just oh, so geez. spoke to me. And I see that. What are you crying after? Mm. What, what, what do you get loud about? What, what just provokes you to set aside your demeanor and your composure and, uh, and just get downright insistent and demanding for? 
<laughs> says, cry after knowledge. Cry after the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. First, uh, in uh, uh, chapter 1 of Proverbs, here Solomon is speaking a, as a father to a son. He sets us up in chapter 1 as a father speaking to a son, directing his heir. He's speaking to his heir. He's speaking generationally. You talk about marrying the generations. He's directing his heir to seek out the wisdom of God and to respect the wisdom of God as uh, the instruction of a father and the law of a mother. In chapter 2, now that we're studying, he today he shows the benefits. He's, he's going to tell us what are the benefits of being a wisdom seeker, what are the benefits of being one who respects the knowledge of God that can only be found by the earnest seeker. This, this doesn't come out to the person that takes the wisdom of God like it's cod liver oil mm -hmm. or like this handful of supplements I take every day. It's like, okay, let me choke this stuff down. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's not like that. No. You know, we, sometimes we approach the Word of God as though it's a responsibility, a distasteful thing, but we're going to do it anyway because we know it's good for us. No, it's crying after. Mm -hmm. It's as the deer pants for the water brooks. We're crying after. Uh, we're not just speaking of natural human wisdom or knowledge, but of the wisdom rooted in God mm -hmm. and knowledge found out in the mind of God. Now, in the book of James... We see the contrast. There are two wisdoms and two kinds of knowledge. Here's the contrast between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. James 3, verse 15 through 17. The wisdom, this wisdom, the wisdom of the world, is not from above. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that tells you everything you need to know about it. It's <laughs> not from above. Mm -hmm. But it is earthly, yeah. sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. In other words, the wisdom of the world is how can I get ahead of the other guy? How can I step on somebody else on my way to promotion? But the wisdom that is from above is pure. Mm -hmm. Pure. It's not murky. You know, I take uh, two kinds of supplements. I take one supplement that's been prescribed to me that's prepared in a lab uh, according to pharmaceutical standards. That same supplement you can purchase over the counter, but it's not produced pharmaceutically. And you could take those two exactly the same things, and you could take those two supplements side by side and look at them. One of them is absolutely clear. You could read a newspaper through it. The other one is cloudy and murky. See, in other words, you, know, you don't know if you can trust that or not. There's something in there that's not pure. See, how would you like to have the pure extract? Jeremiah talked mm -hmm. about, listen to me people, Jeremiah talked about extracting the precious from the vile. Amen. It's all about, uh, Moses said that the wisdom of God would distill in him, the knowledge of God would distill on the inside of him. It's a distillation process. Don't mind the children, they're out there barking at a squirrel. Uh, this is the... When you're talking about earthly wisdom, many see wisdom from an earthly perspective as the means of getting over in life at the expense of others. As though we are to view all others as competitors to be defeated. And we use wisdom in the pursuit of attainment and success to get ahead of others. This is the earthly wisdom based on sense knowledge. Sense knowledge or sensual wisdom, think about it, it's based on the senses. It's based on experience, opinion, and human rationalistic deduction. Sense knowledge says, I'll believe it when I see it. The God kind of wisdom and knowledge is exactly the reverse. It says, I have believed, therefore I'll see it. You see the difference? The wisdom of the world says, I'll believe it when I see it, like Thomas. The God kind of wisdom says, I believe it, therefore I will see it. The very basis of God's wisdom is, first, it's pure, it's peaceable, 
Some people think they're wise and they want to enter into a debate. You see people that think they're wise and they use what they think they know to have a debate and a disagreement. They're always correcting somebody. That's not the wisdom of God. Even if it's theological knowledge, it does not arise. It's from the earth earthly. It's not from above. People who think they know something are always willing to get into an argument to point out what they know. But the wisdom that is from above is peaceable. The wisdom, when you have the wisdom of God, you're not picking a fight with anybody. <laughs> gentle. The wisdom from above is gentle. You ever see somebody who thinks they know something about God and they're not gentle? It's merciful. It's merciful. You ever see somebody take the Bible and beat somebody over the head with it? That's not the, they say they're doing it because they're anointed. No, that's not. It may be an anointing, but it's not from God. There is an mm. anointing from hell. That's right. It's called a demonic religious spirit. Good fruits. It has good fruit. It's impartial, and it is without hypocrisy. How can you minister without hypocrisy by only telling what you've seen and heard? If you are preaching something you have not experienced, then that's like offering somebody Saul's armor. Mm -hmm. How do you avoid being a hypocrite? If you are preaching something that you have not experienced, that is the equivalent of hypocrisy. I don't care how sincere you are. Right. You know, there's a lot of people out there preaching lofty things, but if they limited themselves to what only preaching what they've experienced of the goodness of God, they wouldn't have much to say. Because they're out there trying to prove Saul's armor. And they need to get quiet and go find the armor of God that God intended for them. Because the armor of God that God intended for them will not only put them over, it will put over the people they minister to because it'll be something that is proven in their life. What's a hypocrite? Somebody that's offering you Saul's armor. That's why Kitty and I always restrict ourselves to only what we've seen and heard. Look, folks, we know what it is to see everything we see and do become as effective as if God said it or did it. And when we provoke you and when we challenge you and when we disciple you and when we reach out to you, we're trying to impart to you of that which we've tasted and seen of the things of God. And if what we have tasted and seen produces in your life your version of what is produced in our life, Praise you're going to be uber blessed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we, we teach people, oh, we want to know the secret to walking and breakthrough. Okay. And we teach them something. And remember you, see, you asked. <laughs> you remember you asked. And uh, we teach them and you see these question marks come over their tops of their heads or we see them get distracted. Mm -hmm. Or we see them respond as though they know what we're talking about and we know they don't have any clue what we're talking about because we can look at the level of breakthrough in their life that's not there. Because we know if they did, God's no respecter of persons, that if they did with their faith what we have done with our faith, remember the scripture says, whose faith follow, mm -hmm. they would have the same results and they're not having the same results. But they want to argue with us the finer points of theology as to why they don't think what we're saying is going to work for them. And they just don't get it. <laughs> and we're trying to help them. See, you, if you, it's all about coming out of hypocrisy. You know, in Christian culture, leadership is inherent with hypocrisy because so many are getting up preaching something they have not tasted of. Mm -hmm. And they're not walking in. <laughs> so, uh, the wisdom from above is peaceable, gentle, merciful, full of good works, impartiality. It's without hypocrisy. And I like that. It's easy to be entreated, James said. Easy. To, see, in this world, there are those who considered to be wise. They project themselves as unapproachable. Oh, I'm wise. I'm wise. Can't don't come. This. Don't come close to me. <laughs> uh, I won't step out onto the platform until it's time for me to speak. And uh -oh. My 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 armor bearer will usher me off the platform immediately after I speak. And oh, come on now. Being inapproachable. The wisdom of God is easy to be, is approachable. We see this very strong in the clergy-laity dichotomy in Christian culture. But God says that the wisdom of God, if you see the unapproachable person, you see somebody who's got four bodyguards and you can't get close to him because he thinks he's so important, that's a fool. That's a fool. That is a foolish thing. 
And if he sees that apart as who he is, then he sees himself as what the scripture defines as a fool. We're to be approachable. Jesus was approachable. He was the embodiment of wisdom. But so unassuming that little children in his presence would instantly want to go to him and climb up into his lap. (laughs) See, this shows you that faith works by love. Mm -hmm. This wisdom is not sterile like the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of God is fraught with emotion and it is without the stern artificiality of the affectation of those who see themselves as imbued with wisdom. They think it's from God and it's really the wisdom of the world. Verse 5 tells us that if we seek wisdom, you will find knowledge. Now get that. How do I get knowledge? Go to school. Mm -hmm. If we seek wisdom, wisdom, we will find knowledge. Now, you got it's more than poetry. He's telling us something. See, many seek knowledge without consideration of seeking after wisdom. But he says, if you seek, verse 5 says, if you seek wisdom, you'll find knowledge. Sir Francis Bacon, the 16th century Lord Chancellor of England, he's the guy that said, knowledge is power. This maxim dominates Western thought in the information age. We think, even as believers, that if we just know what God wants us to do, or if we know what God thinks, that's the key to shift and change in our lives. That's not what the writer of Proverbs is saying. The writer of Proverbs is saying to us that wisdom precedes knowledge. Wisdom is more than philosophy and more than artful cunning. Proverbs 4.7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. But in all of our learning systems, and even in the church, and even in academic culture, we spend billions of dollars filling young minds full of mush, full of the mush of knowledge, and then we leave them to founder in darkness when it comes to the wisdom traditions that will actually put them over in life. Let us change our minds and begin to acknowledge, as does the writer of Proverbs, the supremacy of wisdom over knowledge. I think every elementary school should abut up to and adjoin a convalescent home Mm -hmm. and get them little kids in there in front front of all those old folks full of wisdom Mm -hmm. who know how to apply the knowledge that's taught in school. Mm -hmm. (laughs) See, knowledge puffs up. What does knowledge do? Puffs up. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says, But wisdom will put you over in life. Wisdom is so esteemed in Scripture that in 1 Corinthians 1.30, we see that God made Jesus to be our wisdom. Now, he didn't say, interestingly enough, he didn't say God made Jesus to be our knowledge. Right. If so, we'd be saved because of what we know and lost because of what we don't know. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad (laughs) that we're not saved because of what we know? We don't even know what we don't know. Yeah, not only do we not know what we know, we don't know what we don't know. And if we and if we knew it, we wouldn't know it. We we knew it, we wouldn't know that we knew it. Uh-huh. Wisdom, go after wisdom. See, he didn't make Jesus to be our knowledge; he made Jesus to be our wisdom. Jesus is our and and listen, Jesus is our wisdom, and he's our savior and Lord. So, if Jesus is our wisdom and he's our savior and Lord, wisdom is your savior. And wisdom is your Lord. Is wisdom your Lord? You get under pressure, I'm going to do something if I do it wrong. Is wisdom your Lord? Who's in control of what happens next when you're under pressure? (laughs) Verse 10 through the end of the chapter. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man... From the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their path, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God, for her house inclineth unto death and her paths Unto, de- unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. 
that thou mayest walk in the, in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressor, transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Verse 10 says that wisdom makes knowledge pleasant. Wisdom makes knowledge pleasant. Knowledge without wisdom is not appealing. Knowledge without wisdom produces nothing but sour outcomes for us. Mm -hmm. How many people with an MBA have you seen working at McDonald's? It doesn't happen every day, but I've seen it all the time in this economy. People with college educations working for $8 an hour. You look, pick up the paper and you start looking at jobs. I've seen jobs. <laughs> Say, we, wanna, we, got, we need a forklift driver. Uh, if you don't have a college degree, no need to apply. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. People out there with a college degree. How many go to college for four years? Uh, what, are you, what are you majoring in? I'm majoring in forklift. <laughs> mm. See, how many, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but without wisdom, it will avail you nothing. See, wisdom is like salt on a tasteless meal. It makes knowledge palatable. Wisdom makes knowledge palatable, palatable to our hearts and useful in our lives. When wisdom is received and takes root in our heart and in our thinking, several things will happen and it goes on to tell us. Verse 11 says, when wisdom finds its rightful place in our hearts, that discretion will begin to preserve you. Like salt preserves food, meat. It will, understanding will keep you. Keep you from what? Keep you from trouble. <laughs> keep your foot from being taken in a snare. When wisdom enters your heart, beloved, it will deliver you from the evil man and from those that speak forward or perverse things. The wisdom of the world and the knowledge of the world is, is seen as something hidden to be found out, not accessible. You know, that's what the idea of what the word occult means. It means hidden knowledge. The world portrays wisdom and knowledge as something deep that cannot be found out by casual inquiry. But Proverbs contradicts that. Remember in the chapter we read yesterday, wisdom cries in the streets. Mm -hmm. Wisdom's crying on the street corner. God's not hiding His wisdom from us. Mm -hmm. It's like a woman crying at the corner of every street to instruct us and bring us out of the ignorance of the world from being simpletons to being those that speak the words of God and becoming those who have the mind of God. When wisdom enters your heart, five things this chapter says will happen. Number one, discretion will preserve you. Amen. I remember somebody said, I'd, I'd, I'd counsel this person about discretion. Use a little discretion. Uh, the Bible says a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut, is considered a wise man. That's what discretion is. You know, my daddy always said, preachers got something to say about everything. That's why if you hang around Russ Walden much, if you're around me in social settings, you won't hear me talk much unless I'm spoken to. Why? Because I've disciplined myself. The scripture says, wisdom in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What does that mean? Don't ever answer a question you haven't first been asked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I've learned, like my Aunt Sue used to say, I've been around the teacup long enough to find the handle. Uh, learn to use discretion. Discretion will preserve you. How do you say, so, well, how do I know I need that? How many of you are in a situation right now and you say, this stinks! <laughs> See, something that's not preserved, it rots. And it stinks. It stinks! <clears throat> okay, let the Word discern you. Let me help you with that. Find out what discretion, the wisdom, in the, the wisdom of God in your heart. It's not just going after discretion. No, you're going after what wisdom produces. Get the wisdom of God in your heart. And the wisdom of God in your heart will cause discretion to preserve you. Without the wisdom of God in your heart, you'll try to exercise discretion and it'll misfire. 
<laughs> and get you in a worse situation. Right. It says understanding will keep you. Not the understanding of the world. The understanding of the world, I understand it. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat a worm. That's what the wisdom of the world says. The understanding of the world. But when you have the wisdom of God on the inside of you, the understanding, the comprehension of the mind of God reaches out and wraps its arms around you. And it keeps you. What does it keep you? Well, really, what it does is it saves you from yourself. <laughs> I'm about to do something if I do it wrong. And understanding the wisdom of God reaches up, takes you by the elbow, and whispers in your ear, saying, hold on. Just wait. Don't say, don't say a thing. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, now let's not do that. Good. The wisdom of God. Amen. How many can feel the anointing on that? Amen. Some, somebody just got free. Mm -hmm. It will deliver you from the person speaking perverse things. That's right. How many of you are, find yourself around perversion? Social perversion. Spiritual perversion. Mental perversion. Twisted logic. Uh, the wisdom of God will deliver you from that person. The, liver, the wisdom of God will deliver you from the strange woman. <laughs> I could name a few <laughs> in popular culture. Don't do it. <laughs> the wisdom of God will deliver you from a, you know, a strange woman. And what he's really saying, if you really understand how the Jewish mystics understood the metaphors here, the woman in Scripture, in the wisdom literature, many times represents the soul. The soul of man when it's walking in the ascendancy in your life, is like a strange woman. It's sitting in the seat of authority in your life where only Jesus should, should be, and you're letting your feelings and your thoughts and your willfulness control you rather than the Spirit of God, the wisdom of God, reign being Savior and Lord. Amen. See, so the strange woman, if you understand what he's saying, it's a whole lot more than what's just being said on the surface. And see... Because she, the, the strange woman rejects wisdom. What is that? She rejects Jesus because Jesus is our wisdom. Sure. People that don't accept Jesus, they've been seduced by a strange woman. Sure. The strange woman of their own soul. Yeah, and they're, being, they're, they're in fornication. Mm -hmm, perversion. They're in fornication mm -hmm. with their mind and their mm -hmm. emotions and their willfulness. They're letting their mind, their will, and their emotions control them and lead them like you said, her steps go down into hell. Do you see there's much deeper truth here than what Amen. you might understand? Amen. And the wisdom of God will cause you to keep the paths of God. Well, who's the path of God? Jesus. Who's your righteousness? 1 Corinthians one thirty. Jesus. <laughs> see, things will happen or be made manifest in your life when wisdom enters your heart. You realize that you're, you have just entered into the second chapter of a life-changing book of the Bible. You will never be the same by the time we get through this book. Because we're not coming at it like a bunch of pithy sayings by an old dude named Solomon. <laughs> 1 Corinthians one thirty again. Jesus is your wisdom. What we're doing is we're stepping behind the curtains of the very persona and soul of Jesus as we study this. It's like going backstage behind the thoughts of Jesus. We're going to look out at our world through the eyes of Jesus, who is our wisdom as we study this book. So remember and reinforce in your thinking that wisdom is not about pithy sayings or proverbs such as Confucius say. Wisdom is a person. Wisdom is who God makes Jesus to be to us. Wisdom, according to Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, is one of the seven spirits of God. Wisdom is a force beyond the mind of man or even the spiritual nature of the inner man. Wisdom causes you to keep the paths of the righteous. And again, who are the righteous? Well, 1 Corinthians one thirty again tells us Jesus is our righteousness. In John 14.6, we see that Jesus is also our path. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus is your path, what does that mean? That means you get out of bed tomorrow morning, and all day long you live life in the Jesus style. 
The path of the righteous is more than moral excellence. The path of the righteous is the path of those who are walking in entitlement with God. When you're walking the path of the righteous that wisdom will immerse you in, you're in the current of a process in which God causes everything you say and do to become as effective as if God said it or did it. And it is wisdom that we respond to as the overture of heaven to bring us into that level of experience. Glory to God. More nuggets on wisdom. Father, we thank you for more wisdom. Every day we can grow in the wisdom of God. Every day uh, that we avail ourselves in your presence and your word, we find out more of you and, and more of your the aspects of your character, the ways that we need to be, uh, as opposed to what the way we've been raised. We uh, want to be raised by you, Father. We want to we want to be a representation, a reflection of who you are. And so we thank you for these precious words of life that come to us day by day as we study your word. And we bless our little listening family with the knowledge of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.